Hello and welcome to Car Church tonight. Good to be with you again. That seems to be our weekly greeting, but I never take for granted our chance to be together in the Word, and uh, I'm traveling again uh, this evening, so I'm coming to you from an undisclosed location, <laughs> uh, but from the car, as always. And uh, tonight, I want you to turn with me in your Bible to Galatians, uh, Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, chapter 1. And our title tonight is The True Revelation. Uh, I thought about titling this The Gospel of Revelation, but the more I began thinking about it, the more I began considering the, the words that we're going to be looking into tonight, this seemed to be a more fitting title, The True Revelation. Um, and I want us to begin tonight with prayer. Patty is again with my grandson tonight, uh, but let's have a word of prayer tonight. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege to be together in your word. I never take that for granted, Father. Never take for granted the chance to just talk to you and know that you're hearing us, to share our hearts with you, to call upon your name, to draw upon the power of your life within us. These things never grow wearisome to me, Lord. They become more and more amazing and more and more wondrous the longer I plumb the depths of them. And Lord, tonight I just pray that in this message, again this evening, you would just reveal to us what the true revelation of the entirety of our Christian life really is. And deliver us, Lord, from chasing tangents, from getting lost in the eddies of unnecessary things, Help us to build our lives on the rock of who you are. And I pray this in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. So Galatians chapter 1, we're talking about the true revelation. I said this week in my introductory remarks that uh, it's so easy, especially in the day in which we're living, to get just paralyzed by the amount of information that's coming our direction, the amount of teaching, the amount of input, the amount of ideologies, the amount of doctrines and theologies and focuses. And, you know, we can just be overwhelmed. There was a time when you kind of went to church once a week, you got your message and that was it. But now, man, we're just overwhelmed with information. And here's another example of that, our teaching tonight. But Lord, I know that there is a huge difference between being overwhelmed with a constant barrage of new information all the time, new perspectives, new ideas, and really getting back to the fundamental, primary, uh, irreducible truths of our Christian experience. And that's exactly what the Word calls us to, is back to the irreducible, the foundational truth of all of our Christian experience. So many times when I teach on this idea of Christ in me, the hope of glory, of his life in me, I call it the theology of everything. Because once you really begin to understand the difference between you living your life for Christ and Christ living his life through you, it fundamentally changes your whole perspective of what our role is. Instead of it being one of trying to glean as much information as we can so that we know what we can do for the Lord, it becomes all about focusing our heart on how to yield and surrender to his life so that he can do what he wants to do through us. And in a sense, it simplifies the focus of our life. And we're going to see that here in just a moment. Let's look here. Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 11. I'm going to read verse 11 through 24. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being much more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were, with, who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia. I returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I remained with him for 15 days. 
but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were only hearing, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. Now there's so much richness in this, but it's so easy to read it like I just read it, just kind of read through it. Oh, okay, so Paul got this information from the Lord, and you know, uh, he, he who used to destroy the church now became the preacher of the church. And just to move right past it. But let's don't do that. Let's stop and listen with the ears of the Spirit to what Paul the Apostle just told us in his own testimony. First of all, he starts by letting us know this, that the true gospel, the true gospel is not based on just education or information but it's based on a revelation, a revelation. The true gospel is based on a revolution, revolution. What is that revelation? Look what he says. I want to make known to you, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. In other words, what I'm teaching you, what I'm sharing with you, what I'm speaking about, what I'm testifying to, what I'm witnessing to is not something that is according to man. Verse 12, I neither received it from man. So what I'm testifying to, what I'm witnessing to, what I'm proclaiming to you uh, is not something that is according to man, and nor did he receive it from man. And then he says, nor was I taught it. So the, the life that Paul the Apostle is calling us to, and he's speaking to the Galatians about, is not according to man, he says it wasn't received by man and it wasn't taught to him by man, but he said it came through a different way. It came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So to begin with, the gospel, the true gospel, is not based on education or information. The true gospel is based on a revelation but it's a revelation, not of a body of knowledge, a revelation, not of a group of doctrines and theologies, a revelation, not of a, a perspective of religious insight. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say it came through a revelation from Jesus. It doesn't say it came for, through a revelation about Jesus. He says, the gospel that I preached did not come according to man, it did not come uh, from man, and it wasn't taught to me by man, it came from a revelation of the person of Jesus. Now why is this important? Because the true revelation, the true revelation of the Christian life is the revelation of the person of Jesus. Not what Jesus did for us alone, not what Jesus came to teach us alone, not just a body of knowledge about Jesus, not just information that comes to us from Jesus, but it's Christ himself is the revelation. That's why the Bible says that things were hidden since before the foundations of the earth, but have now been revealed. What is it that has been revealed? Look at with me, Colossians chapter 1. Look at Colossians chapter 1, and let's see how, again, Paul writing to the church in Colossae, he says, I, in verse 26, that the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. What is it? To them God willed to make known, that's revelation, what are the riches of the gloriousness of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory him we preach so what is the revelation that's been hidden before the foundations of the earth but it's now been revealed what is the revelation that's not according to man that didn't come from man and it wasn't taught by man that paul was preaching what was paul preaching he was preaching christ not about christ he wasn't preaching a message he'd gotten from christ he wasn't preaching a message he'd gotten from men about christ he was preaching christ Christ, Christ, Christ. 
Now, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you this is the critical, most important foundational truth you can ever understand, is that the Christian life is the life of Christ in the Christian. And that life revealed, manifested, expressed through the life of the believer as we learn to yield to and surrender to the power of that life. When we turn Christianity into a message about what Jesus did, or what he's going to do someday, when we turn the message of Christianity into a message about the doctrines and theologies and, and perspectives that Jesus shared with us, that we now need to go implement and live up to by the power of our cho choice and will, we are robbing the gospel of its power. Because the power of the gospel, the true revelation of the gospel, is not a message from Christ, not a message about Christ. It's Christ. Christ is the message. Christ is the revelation. And when Paul says, the gospel I'm preaching is a gospel not about, not from, but of Jesus Christ, because I got a revelation of who Christ was, and he says here again over there in Colossians that he preaches him. I don't preach about him. I don't preach something I got from him. I preach him. That's what it says in Colossians chapter 1 there, verse 28. Him we preach. Why? Because he is the mystery. Because he is what's been revealed. Because Christ in us is the mystery. This is the power of the message that is the true heart of the gospel. It's not a message about Jesus. It's not a message from Jesus. It's not about what he did for us. It's not about what we should be doing for him. It's about him and what he right now can do, yearns to do, is available to do, and came to do in us and through us. That's why Christ in us is the hope of glory. And that's why the true revelation of the Christian life is not about or from. It is Christ himself. By the way, we're going to see that this is more and more reiterated in this passage. Now, verse 13, he says, by the way, think about this. The difference between a man-centered gospel and a Christ-centered gospel. A man-centered gospel is something that's according to man. It's something that comes from man. It's something that's taught by man. And its primary call is the call to man to do something for God. But a Christ-centered gospel is according to Christ. It's a gospel that's from Christ. It's a gospel that teaches us about Christ. And the message of that gospel is Christ himself. It's an entirely Christ-centered gospel or good news, the revelation of Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So look at verse 13. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. Now we're talking religion. How I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So we find that the true gospel is not based on education or information, but on a revelation of Christ. We find that the true gospel is not about law and tradition. It's about life and transformation. It's not about us simply becoming more adept, more skillful at articulating and, and defining the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what's good, what's evil, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false. It's not the gospel that Paul preached wasn't about that. It wasn't about law. It wasn't about tradition. He had been the traditionalist of traditionalists. He had been the religionist of religionists. He had all of that background and history. He advanced in Judaism beyond his contemporaries. He was exceedingly zealous for the traditions of man. But you see, the gospel is not about former religious conduct. It's not about advanced knowledge of religion. And it's not about zeal for traditions. That's not the gospel. 
It doesn't matter whether it's a Baptist tradition or an Episcopal tradition or a Methodist tradition or a Pentecostal tradition. It doesn't matter what form that tradition takes. That's not what the gospel's about. The gospel is not about the trappings and the frames. The gospel is not about the doctrines and the theologies. The gospel is about the living Christ. The living power of Jesus Christ alive in the inside of the heart and the spirit of man. This is the gospel that Paul preached. Him we preach. Him we preach. Oh, saints, I don't know if you can hear how stirred my heart is when I see the difference between the religious traditionalism of man and the vibrant, dynamic, and animating power of the life of Christ in the believer. But Paul, who was the most religious, traditional, bound man you could comprehend, he was of the, you know, circumcised on the eighth day, born of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, the strictest sect of religionists in that day. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the 70 ruling body of Israel. And he was more zealous and more advanced in his religious understandings than all of his contemporaries. And yet all of that, he says, when he found Christ and he found what could happen with Christ in him, he abandoned all of that, and he counted it as dung, the Bible says, that he might gain a knowledge of Jesus? No. That he might gain uh, the traditions of Christianity? No. That he might gain a deeper understanding into what Christ came to teach? No. That he might gain Christ. <laughs> Not information about him, but him. The very living power of his life inside. This is what he counted all of his religious traditions and all of his accolades, uh, trained under Gamaliel, a brilliant scholar of, this, of the scriptures. He put all that away to gain Christ because he knew all of his knowledge, all of his information, all of his studies, all of his scholarship, all it did was make him an egg-headed traditional religionist who could not perform the very things he was an expert at teaching and explaining. Does that strike home with anybody besides me? This is the unique power of the gospel, the true gospel, is that it's not about more information and education of what we should be doing for him because of what he did for us. It's about more transformational life being released on the inside of us as we learn to yield to the living Christ and the power of his life in us. Notice how he says it. I was, uh, my former conduct in Judaism there in 13, I persecuted the church. Verse 14, I advanced in Judaism beyond my contemporaries. Verse 14, part B, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But, he says, but, when it pleases, pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Notice this. Paul says, I had all of this religious tradition, all of this body of information, all of this scholarly input, all of this, but notice what he says. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. Can I tell you 90% of people will read that? and think that it says to reveal his son to me? To re reveal things about his son to me? To re reveal things from his son to me? But notice that what was revealed, the true revelation is what we're talking about. What was revealed to Paul was not information about Jesus. It was Jesus in him. <laughs> this is the great revelation. This is the mystery hidden before the foundations 
now revealed, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And that's why Paul said, it's him we preach in Colossians. That's why he says here, the gospel that I'm preaching is not from man, not according to man. I wasn't taught it by man. It's the revelation of Jesus. It's not a, a, simply a, another version of my religious tradition. It's not simply a new insight into some theological concepts. It's a person, the person of Christ in me. This is the message of the gospel. How did we lose it? How did we turn it into be about a bunch of religious activity for God in gratitude for what he did for us? Rather than it being the revelation of Christ in us, the hope of glory, the revelation that his son is in us and us learning how to cooperate with and relinquish control of our life to let him express the power of his life through us. This is the true revelation. Now notice this. He says, when God did this, what did he do? Four things. He First of all, he separated me. He separated me unto grace, which is undeserved, unmerited favor. He, he separated me. He called me according to grace. And then he revealed. What did he reveal? Information, education, theology, doctrine. What did he reveal? He revealed Christ. Christ in him. Do you see this? I know people have literally been to church their entire life and never got that revelation of Christ in them, the hope of glory. The revelation they got was Christ for them on the cross. The revelation they got is Christ waiting for them in heaven. But their perception of what the Christian life is about is that between the time of what Christ did for them on the cross and what Christ is waiting, waiting for them in heaven is, is up to them now to grit their teeth, pull their stuff up by their bootstraps, consider the depths of Christ's sacrifice, and then by the power of their will, determine that they're going to live a good Christian life for him. Well, good luck with that. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. He didn't mean apart from me helping you out, giving you some guidance. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. What can a branch do apart from a vine? It can't do anything. What is the life of a branch apart from the vine? It is no life. It has no life. That's why the Bible says when Christ, who is our life, appears, will appear with him in glory. That's why it says, for to me to live is Christ, Paul speaking Philippians. For to me to live is Christ. And to die, that means to go to heaven, is gain. That's why, again, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, over and over and over again, what is he trying to communicate to us? He's trying to communicate to us that the revelation of the Christian life is Christ. The revelation that we need is Christ. We don't need a million new uh, you know, revelations, a million new uh, ideas, uh, the, the latest fad to pass through the body of Christ that we need to you know, become an expert about. What we need is Christ alive in us and then step by step moment by moment day by day learn more and more to yield to his life surrender to his guidance uh, relinquish control to his lordship and allow jesus to actually live through us not us live for him him live through us this was the revelation. Do you see this? It's right here in your Bible. This is the revelation. He, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son, not to me, in me. That was the revelation Paul had. Notice what happens. He says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. Remember, Paul had left Jerusalem. He was on his way to Damascus when Christ met him on the road, exploded the mythology of his religiosity, revealed himself and to Paul, and then in Paul, came to dwell in Paul by the power of his spirit. And the Bible says Paul did not go back to Jerusalem. He didn't go back to the apostles. He went to Arabia. And then he went back to Damascus. Remember, he left Jerusalem 
on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians and persecute them. He didn't go back to Jerusalem. He went from where he was to Arabia, came back to Damascus. It wasn't until three years later, after the Damascus Road experience, that he came back to Jerusalem. And guess how long he was there? Two weeks. It says in verse 18, and he remained with Peter for 15 days. Only apostle he met. He said, I didn't even see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, concerning the things which I'm writing to you, he says, I want you to, I'm not telling you a lie. I got saved on the road to Damascus. I got filled with the Spirit. I went to Arabia. I came back to Damascus. I didn't go back to Jerusalem for three years. I didn't confer with flesh and blood. I didn't talk to the apostles. In other words, the gospel I'm preaching to you, I didn't get it. It's not according to man. I didn't get it from man, and I wasn't taught it by them. I got a revelation of Christ and Christ in me. That was the revelation that I got. From that revelation of Christ in me, from my yieldedness to the power of Christ in me, I went three years without even meeting any of the apostles. When I did meet them, I met Peter and James. For 14, 15 days I was there. Then look at this. He says, verse 21, Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches in Judea, which are in Christ. Nobody in, Je in Jerusalem even knew what I looked like. They were only hearing how he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Look at chapter 2, verse 1, and I'm just coming to a close, but look what it says. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Now track this with me. There's an important point here. Maybe the most, one of the most important points I could give you. The true gospel is not about the affirmation of men. It's about the transformation of the spirit. The true gospel. Saints, there is a religious Christianity that is all about appearances. It's all about getting human affirmation. It's all about how we look to others, but it's got virtually nothing to do with a true transformation on the inside of us. It mostly has to do with the extent to which we are able to appear to act like a Christian. Well, notice this about Paul. Paul was not interested in the affirmation of man. He got saved on the road of Damascus, not because somebody taught him about Jesus, because Jesus met him. He got a revelation, not of information about Christ, but of Christ himself. Christ came and lived inside of him. Then he went three years into Arabia and back to Damascus before he even went back to his hometown, which is in Jerusalem. And then he only stayed for 15 days. After 15 days, he left Jerusalem and he was gone for 14 years. Out in, in Antioch and all these places. And he was preaching the gospel. Let me, I just did a partial list. Look, listen to this. He went from that two-week visit to Syria, Cilicia. He went to Seleucia, to Cyprus, to Salamis, to Paphos, to Perga and Pamphylia, to Antioch in, in Pisidia, to Iconium, to Lystra, to Dur, back to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, Pisidia, to Pamphylia, to Perga, to Atalia, to Antioch. He went to Phoenicia and Samaria, and he went to Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, Derba, Lystra, Mysia, Troas, Samothrace, Neapolis, Philippi, Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Centria, Ephesus, Caesarea, Antioch, Galatia, Perigia, to Ephesus, to Macedonia, Acacia, and then 14 years later, he came back to Jerusalem. Guess what was driving all of that activity? Listen to me. Listen to me. What was driving all of that activity? It was not the seeking of the affirmation of man. He wasn't performing for the religious leaders. He didn't even, they didn't even know what he looked like and he never even met except for Peter and for James. Here he is now nearly 20 years from the Damascus road before he ends up back in Jerusalem. 
and even when he ends up back there, he says, you know, those who were purported to be somebody important, I don't know what they were. It didn't matter to me. What was he saying? He wasn't performing. He was not performing for the affirmation of man. He was instead being transformed by the power of the Spirit. In other words, he was listening to the Holy Spirit within him, and he was following what the Spirit was telling him to do day by day, and he was going from city to city. When he got to that city, he prayed, and the Lord led him to the next city. When he got to that city, he prayed, and the Lord said, go back to the city you came from. This is how he was living his life. He had not come up with a 10-year plan. He didn't live you know, trying to think, well, now what would Peter think? What would be a good way for me to get Peter's attention? What would be a good way for me to, to get some of these other apostles to, you know, to recognize so that maybe then I can move up, I could become maybe a pastor in Jerusalem. Maybe they give me one of the bigger churches if I went to this school or did that. Saints, I don't mean to be belaboring this, but what I'm trying to say to you is we're trying to get to the bottom line, the true revelation. What is it? It's not according to man. It's not. From man, it's not taught. By man, it is a revelation of Christ. It's not a revelation about Christ or from Christ. It's Christ himself. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory, the mystery that's been hidden before the foundation of the world, now revealed. It's him P P uh, Paul went out to preach. And he did not go and confer with flesh and blood. He didn't try and get the attention of important people. He didn't seek to climb some spiritual or ecclesiastical ladder to gain some position so they could comfort himself that he was an important person in the, in the kingdom of God. He went after the life of Christ in him. He listened to the life of Christ in him. He yielded to the life of Christ in him. He, the spirit of God is what forbade him to go some places and called him to go other places. And the result of that, it was nearly 20 years before he came back to the people that would be considered the hierarchy and then he simply came to report to them the miracles of what God was doing among the Gentiles. And they, when they heard it, the Bible says, they glorified God in me. They saw what God was doing in me and through me. And it brought glory to the Lord. Well, who gets glory? Who gets glory? The person who does the work. Why did they glorify God in Paul? Because it was God in Paul was doing the work and the apostles back in Jerusalem they knew it and so they gave God glory hallelujah for what you're doing through Paul saints this is the gospel there's whatever else you've been hearing that's not it this is the gospel the gospel that Paul preached didn't come according to man from man taught by man, it was a revelation of Christ. Do you have that revelation of Christ in you? Has that been revealed to you that Jesus actually came to live inside of you? That he's not there to watch you as an audience member as you attempt to act like him? As you attempt on your own to bear or create or produce fruit for him, He's the one who said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm the vine, you're the branch. You can't do this without me. It is me and me alone in you that is the only revelation you need. You don't need to go to the apostles, to the hierarchy, to the you know the, all the people. You just need to develop and cultivate a listening heart to my spirit. Now, I'm never going to lead you to do something that doesn't agree with this. This becomes like a compass. This becomes like a, you know, like a sextant, like something that helps us, you know, navigate the stars. It's the permanent fixed reality of the nature and character of God. But this, without his life, is only a burden of impossibility. What makes this a joyous adventure an invitation into a life of miracles is that he's planning to implement it through us. This is the revelation. Oh, hallelujah. I saw somebody said, I'm preaching us all happy. Well, I'm preaching myself happy one more time. I cannot let go of this. Here's, here's a burden I have for some of you. 
tonight. And I don't know when someone's going to hear this. Maybe you know somebody that needs to hear this. You know, copy a link and send it to them. I don't ask, I'm not asking for anything. I just want them to know the glory of his life. But I wrote this in my notes. We need to stop jockeying for position and recognition in the church and surrender to the promptings of the Spirit. The only thing that should be guiding our behavior is that Jesus, alive by the Spirit of God in us, gives us a prompting and we obey it. The miracle life of Paul the Apostle, the places he went, and I, I stopped in Acts 29, I didn't even keep going, all the way to Rome, all the way into Caesar's palace. But Paul was just responding to the prompts of the Spirit. He wasn't coming on the basis of some, you know, systematic plan based upon some doctrinal. <laughs> he was just yielding the life of Christ in him. And he turned the world upside down. That's what they said about him. These guys who have turned the world upside down have come here. I'm going to tell you, if you want to turn the world upside down, you're not going to find it by jockeying for position and recognition in the church. You're going to find it by obeying the Spirit of God within you. It doesn't mean that if you're a young believer that you don't recognize spiritual authority. There are going to be times that God had me under spiritual authority because he was training me and teaching me because the particular position I had was I was serving someone else's vision. And in those cases, I needed to yield to. That was part of the, how the Spirit of God was speaking to me is you need to yield to and surrender to as you're being guided through this season of your life. But ultimately, it is the inner guidance of the Spirit of God in agreement with the Word of God and then empowered and activated and animated by the very life of Christ himself. This is the revelation. And I'm telling you, a lot of the stuff you get out there, you can turn it off if you get this. If you get this and start living by this, Jesus will start teaching you anything else you need to know through the power of his word, by the power of his spirit. I wrote as a final mark here, when we yield to him, rather than live for the approval of others, we glorify him and not ourselves, and we leave a lasting legacy. Let me say that again. When we yield to him, rather than live for the approval of others, we glorify him, not ourselves, and we leave a lasting legacy. You know, sometimes, I'm going to tell you something, if I could trace out the trajectory of my life, it has been a trajectory that virtually no sane person <laughs> would have taken. <laughs> I mean, I just got to be honest with you. It seemed like when all the world was going this way, the Lord was having me go that way. When all the church was going this way, the Lord was having me go that way. I mean, I can tell you in so many scenario after scenario after scenario. And yet when I look back, I see how gloriously right the Lord was in the choices he made, the timing of what he did, the actions that he took. They did not come by me calculating, figuring, and trying to sort out the way to go. They came by me saying, Lord, you know I don't know the way to go. It's not within a man to know the way of a man. Lord, you said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. When you begin to live that way, you're going to see a, a kind of life. I'm going to tell you that all you can do is sit back and go, wow. What is the true revelation? What is it? You can chase this idea and chase that one and chase this doctrine and chase that theology. You can go out and fill your mind for hours and hours with every little detail of all the different ideas and perceptions and perceptives. And, you know, a lot of times it's sort of like, well, I think this is the way it's going to be. I think that's what it's going to be. I tell you, for me, I, I have no interest in that. I got one revelation, only one. It's the only one I need, Christ in me, the hope of glory. The only thing I need now 
is the revelation as to the next step he wants me to take. The revelation of what he wants me to do today and tomorrow. Moment by moment, day by day, to live in concert with him, to keep in step with the Spirit. If we were rescued by the Spirit, let's live by the Spirit. That's what the scripture says. Saints, do you have that revelation of Christ in you? If you don't, ask him. Jesus, get me off the roller coaster of all of this craziness that's coming at us. And let me just get settled down on the rock of the foundation upon which everything is built. For another foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Father, tonight, in your name, I just pray for the people that are listening, whether they're listening live tonight, be listening a little later this evening, or listening months or years from now. Lord, that's one reason why I'm doing this, is to leave a legacy of teaching about the life of Christ in me, life of Christ in us. Lord, I just pray that this word tonight will start to resonate deeply. Only you can do this, Lord. But cause it to resonate deeply down to the very core of our hearts. That the revelation, the true revelation, is not about you. It's not just from you. It is you in us. To live through us so that you get the glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, many blessings to you all tonight. Thank you so much for being a part of Car Church. Thank you especially for those of you that take the time to write, to communicate with me. I see your names as they come up on the screen. If I mentioned everyone, that's what we'd spend most of the night doing. But I want you to know each one of you matter to me. I'm so conscious of who's listening and who's paying attention and so thankful, especially for those of you that share uh, these messages with others because that's how this word gets out and makes a difference. Again, I'm not asking for anything from you. I'm just asking you help me get the word out. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Amen. God bless you all tonight. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week in Car Church. And hopefully Patty will be here with me to pray. God bless and have a wonderful evening.